sentenced to life in prison. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife, Maggie, and I would never hurt my son, Papa. From lawyer to witness to convicted felon, Alec Murdoch says his final words in court. What a juror now speaking out says sealed his fate. Plus, I assume that we're going to be in some pretty dark times here. It's cold. It gets really cold at night. I mean, some of the temperatures, you know, have been in the, in the teens. So, I mean, that's dangerous. Days under an historic amount of snow, running out of food and desperate for help. We hear from families stuck and in search of aid. And they tell me you want to be a picture maker. Um, yes, sir, I do. Why? This business, it'll rip you apart. Lindsay Davis takes a look at one of the contenders for best picture, featuring the life of one of the most celebrated directors in generations, Steven Spielberg. And good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff and for Lindsay Davis tonight, thank you so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including the cancerous tissue removed from the president, what the White House physician is now saying about his prognosis, plus the 25-year-old killed in Utah during a police-involved incident, why his family says they are being, quote, stonewalled in their search for answers, and coughing, irritation, pain and burning skin common symptoms that East Palestine residents are now experiencing as they demand the private company behind that train crash pay for their relocation. Our correspondents are across the country tonight covering it all for us. But we begin with the life sentence handed down to convicted murderer Alec Murdoch one day after being found guilty on all counts. Murdoch actually received two consecutive life sentences for the murders of his wife and son. And tonight, authorities have released Murdoch's mugshot, as you can see there, with a newly shaved head. He is being assessed and will soon be assigned permanently to a maximum security prison where he will spend the rest of his life. In an exclusive interview, a juror tells our Eva Pilgrim how it only took 45 minutes to get a unanimous decision. And for him, that cell phone video that showed Murdoch at the scene of the murders sealed his fate. So what comes now? Eva Pilgrim, who has been on this case from the beginning, leads us off tonight. With his hands and feet shackled in a jumpsuit, Alec Murdoch today back in the courtroom to be sentenced for the grisly murders of his wife and son. But the convicted killer first proclaiming his innocence. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never hurt my son Papa. The judge having none of it. And it's so unfortunate because you had such a lovely family saying it was heartbreaking to see the lawyer he knew personally go from grieving husband and father to the man guilty of their murders. And I know you have to see Paul and Maggie during the night times when you're attempting to go to sleep. I'm sure they come and visit you. I'm sure. All day and every night. Yeah, I'm sure. And they will continue to do so and, and reflect on the last time they looked you in the eyes. And given one last chance, Alec Murdoch refusing to confess. And I tell you again, I respect this court, but I'm innocent. Well, it, and it might not have been you. It, it might have been uh, the monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. The judge then handing down his sentence. In the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch, I sentence you for a term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdoch, whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. Murdoch's surviving son, Buster, and his brother looking on as he was led away. Inside the courtroom, juror Craig Moyer, who revealed to ABC News an exclusive interview how the jury reached its decision. When you first got in the room, you took a vote. What was the vote? It was two not guilty, one not sure, and nine guilty. What was your vote? Guilty. Moyer saying it took less than an hour of deliberations for the jury to agree. Probably about 45, maybe an hour. That's really fast. Yeah, the evidence was clear. That juror telling me the key piece of evidence was the video with Murdoch's own voice, along with his wife and son, placing him at the scene of the crime. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. 
she was there at the dog kennel video, which was right before the murders, or right before all the activity on the phones went off. Son Paul Murdoch, who filmed that video minutes before his death, in the end, helping to convict his own father. Alec finally admitting on the stand he was there that night. When he said it was him, were you surprised? I was very surprised. The defense said there's no way he could have done all these things, clean everything up, get it all ready, and then go to his mom's and come back in that short amount of time. Well, I think there's just enough time. Moyer, who was sitting just steps from Murdoch on the stand, was unmoved by moments like this. What did you think when Alec Murdoch took the stand? I didn't think much of him. I didn't see any true remorse or any compassion or anything. Even though he was, he, he cried a lot on the he, stand. He never cried. He never cried. What do you mean by that? All he did was blow snot. Did you not see tears? No tears. How did you know he wasn't crying? Because I saw his eyes. I was this close to him. Did you feel like he was a liar? I did. A good liar. But not good enough. And Eva Pilgrim is here on set with us. I know you just got back, and thank you so much. Um, I have this question for you. Now that we've seen what has happened, he's still charged with roughly 100 other financial crimes, but what about the deaths of these people connected to the Murdochs that people are still interested in? There's a long list of unanswered questions, right? We heard on the stand from the son of Gloria Satterfield, the family's longtime housekeeper, died in a trip and fall accident at the family's home in 2018. Murdoch got insurance money after that housekeeper's fall. In 2015, Stephen Smith, a young man who lived in the area, one of surviving son Buster's classmates, was killed in what was then at the time called a hit and run. Authorities are still looking into both of those cases. And of course, Mallory Beach was killed in a boat crash involving Murdoch's dead son, Paul, in 2019. That case, as we have heard repeatedly in this trial, playing a very big role. Murdoch is still facing a lawsuit for the boat crash, even with this verdict. Right, such a mystery surrounding the whole family. And just quickly, you were down there for about six weeks. You've covered a lot of court cases. Have you ever seen a judge interact with a convicted murderer at sentencing like the judge did this morning? I've never seen anything like that before, but you have to remember, Judge Newman knew Alec Murdoch. He knew his family. He knew his family well. They interacted in a personal way. So in a lot of ways, this was a personal conversation he was having, even though he was having it from the bench. Right. And earlier he had to have his grandfather's picture removed. So mm -hmm. a lot of people knew that family. All right, Eva Pilgrim, thank you so much. Our thanks to Eva for that. And joining us now for more context and analysis is ABC News legal contributor and attorney at the Cochran Law Firm, Shauna Lloyd. Shauna, thanks so much for being here. It's good to see you. Uh, the evidence in this case, as you know, was largely circumstantial. So the prosecution didn't have things like a murder weapon, blood, or an eyewitness to directly connect Murdoch to the murders. Yet the jury only took three hours to convict him. Were you surprised? You know, Phil, and in this particular case, I actually was surprised by how quickly they came back. But let's remember, that video was the most damaging piece of evidence in against his defense. And what they saw when he got on the stand is that he still had no explanation for how it was he was there minutes before this murder and what happened thereafter. And I think that's what really put the nail in the coffin for this particular case. Today, Murdoch's attorney said that that video you're talking about forced him to take that risky move of putting his client on the stand that I know not a lot of defense attorneys like to do. Uh, did Murdoch's testimony help or hurt his own defense? I know with that particular video, he had to explain it. But overall, what do you think? Overall, he hurt his case. He didn't bring anything substantively to the plate for the jurors to have an explanation or to even explain his actions. The little explanation that he gave was that, yes, I did all these bad things with these financial crimes. Yes, I lied. But I can tell you that I did not kill my wife and my child. However, that testimony clearly fell flat. The jurors felt as though he was not genuine. He wasn't remorseful. And he didn't have a solid explanation for what he was doing at the kennels and why he had lied for a year and a half. And that's really what I think his testimony was severely lacking. Yeah, and it seems the uh, the judge thought the same. That was quite a talking to right before sentencing. Uh, Murdoch's defense team says they plan to file an appeal sometime in the next 10 days. We knew that was coming. But looking ahead, do you think this verdict will stand? 
I believe this verdict will stand. Their largest ability to challenge this verdict on the appellate level is going to be based on admitting that financial crimes information into the trial. That's the really, that's where the judge used his discretion, allowed it in. But I believe that this verdict is going to stand. Um, the judge was very, he, very thorough. He had a whole hearing. He was very clear and articulate as to why he was letting it in. So I believe that the verdict will stand. Shana Lloyd, always great to have your legal expertise on the show. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Phil. Now to Washington and a health issue for President Biden. The White House today reporting that the president had a small skin lesion diagnosed as basal cell carcinoma removed from his chest during his annual physical at Walter Reed. Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. The White House tonight revealing a small skin lesion removed from President Biden's chest last month was the most common form of skin cancer, called a basal cell carcinoma. His doctor saying all cancerous tissue was successfully removed and that no further treatment is required. Basal cell carcinoma, though when it's excised appropriately, should be 100% cured. This kind of cancer is often caused by sun exposure. Biden's doctor has previously noted the president did spend a good deal of time in the sun in his youth. It comes just weeks after the first lady had the same kind of cancerous tissue removed from her chest and face. I am so lucky that they caught it, they removed it, and, um, and I'm healthy. And Mary joins me now. Mary, will the president have to have any follow-up to track this issue? Yeah, he will, Phil. Look, the president's doctor says that the site of the lesion that he had on his chest has healed nicely, but that he will need to continue to have regular skin screenings just as part of his routine health care going forward. Phil. All right. Mary Bruce, thank you. Thank you. And now to that massive cross-country storm that arrives in the Northeast tonight. 125 million Americans, 28 states on alert for high wind, flooding, tornadoes, and heavy snow. Take a look at this. This is a funnel cloud spotted in Salina, Texas. There have been at least seven reported tornadoes across the South in the past 24 hours alone. And in Kirby, Texas, significant damage left behind after a confirmed EF2 tornado with winds possibly as high as 130 miles per hour. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all, but first, he has more on the damage already left behind. Tonight, those powerful storms continuing a path of destruction across the South and now pushing north and east. Tornado warnings um, near Atlanta this afternoon. I'm talking to you when I say you need to seek shelter and you need to do it now. Torrential rain hammering Huntsville, Alabama this morning. Overnight, a confirmed tornado touching down in Shreveport, Louisiana, churning up debris, tearing through trees and homes. Power lines exploding in Texas. Wow! Oh my God! Straight line winds up to 80 miles an hour, rolling tractor trailers near Dallas and flipping boats at this nearby marina in Louisville. Drivers taking cover from golf ball sized hail. The system strengthening as darkness fell. Tough night here in Kirby, Arkansas. This is one of at least 20 homes badly damaged or completely destroyed. And look at this two by six piece of wood here impaling this windshield. This was probably a tornado, but it came in the middle of the night, so we're not sure. Either way, a widespread damaging wind event across the Mid-South. The National Weather Service now confirming it was a tornado with EF2 winds possibly up to 135 miles per hour. The severe threat continuing through the night. And Rob Marciano is here now tracking what happens next. Rob. Phil, you know, this storm, uh, incredibly strong. Matter of fact, it's some of the lowest pressure the Heartland has ever measured. It's going to start to go into a weakening mode, but as it does so, it's going to become more wintry for folks to the north, and we still have another hour or two to deal with as far as a tornado threat goes. So here it is on the radar. Uh, finally got through Atlanta, Greenville, so Columbia, South Carolina, still has some work to do here, and that precip is arcing up into the Great Lakes and the northeast. Detroit about to get some heavy snow. They could see a half a foot before this is done. Heavy rain. Cleveland back through Washington, D.C., and then that mix and snow getting into the northeast overnight tonight, a, a mix turning to all rain, I think, along the I-95 corridor once again. Snow accumulating in Boston, you're under advisory. You could see a, a several inches of snow, but maybe a foot or more in some of the places well upstate in northern New England. I think they will take it. It should wrap up tomorrow afternoon. That's when the next storm, believe it or not, comes into the west. This is going to slam California again with more in the way of debilitating mountain snow through Sunday morning. They certainly want the drought to be completely over, but they don't need all this snow all at once another debilitating situation heading into the work week yeah phil all right rob thanks so much 
And ahead, as families are stranded in the California mountains after weeks of heavy snow, we speak to families without electricity, running out of food, and desperate for help. A Pennsylvania woman who went missing more than 30 years ago in a case that stumped investigators who later declared her legally dead has now been found in living in a nursing home in Puerto Rico. The woman left behind a husband and siblings and moved through northern Puerto Rico for a while before she was taken as a person in need to the adult care home in 1999. According to police, she initially kept her past secret while in Puerto Rico, but began to divulge details as she began to suffer from dementia. Ultimately, a DNA test confirmed her identity. In Farmington, Utah, a grief-stricken family is speaking out tonight after 25-year-old Chase Allen was shot and killed by police during what police are describing as a routine traffic stop. However, the family is saying Allen was a victim of a brutal murder, their words, and claim they are being stonewalled from getting more information. According to police, Allen was pulled over by an officer in the parking lot of the post office. He allegedly became non-compliant, so for four more officers were called to the scene. The family claims that when he refused to get out of the car, more than 12 rounds were fired by the five officers. It's unclear whether Allen was armed. No officers were injured. Farmington police chief weighed in. That's how we trained, and I know my guys, and if they fired shots, I'm certain they were in fear of their life. Allen's family described the former high school athlete as gracious, loving, a gracious, loving soul who was studying law. Walgreens says it will not start selling an abortion pill in 20 states. The drugstore chain announcement uh, signals the access to mufepristone may not expand as broadly as federal regulators intended in January when they finalized a rule change allowing more pharmacies to provide the pill. Last month, attorneys general in 20 conservative-led states warned CVS and Walgreens in a letter that they could face legal consequences if they sell abortion pills by mail or in their states. Now to Ohio, where residents of East Palestine are still furious and fearful after a tense meeting with town leaders and railroad officials, with some demanding to be relocated at the company's expense. It comes as the EPA has ordered Norfolk Southern to conduct new chemical tests for cancer-causing compounds. Here's ABC's Mona Koser Abdi reporting in from Ohio. No Angry residents of East Palestine, Ohio, confronting government and company officials in a heated town hall. Are you proud of it? Left with still so many unanswered questions a month after that devastating train derailment. I want you to tell me why everybody in my community is getting sick. Community members lining up to report concerns about their health and their livelihoods. This has touched me on every level. We are sorry. We're very sorry. The EPA now ordering the company to begin testing for dioxins, an environmental pollutant that can form during the combustion of vinyl chloride, the dangerous chemical released in the controlled burn after the derailment. Dioxins are highly toxic and can cause cancer and other health problems. They also take a long time to break down once they're in the environment. We will direct the company to conduct immediate cleanup if contaminants from the derailment are found at levels that jeopardize people's health. Today, ABC affiliate WEWS was on site as the company began to remove rail from the location of the accident, digging out and sampling the contaminated soil underneath as part of their massive cleanup. And that Herculean cleanup effort continues. Mona joins me now. Mona, what's the latest on the testing process for that contamination there that you've been talking about? Well, Phil, as that testing process continues, Norfolk Southern right now is warning that the track work actually may cause more odors in the area. And so far, 11 monitors have been set up to continue to test the air quality here. But so far, Phil, the EPA says that they have found no evidence of dioxin exposure. Phil? All right, Mona Kosarabdi, thank you. Now to the war in Ukraine. As Russia's foreign minister was met with laughter at a global meeting in India over what he said about the war, Meantime, on the front lines, Ukrainian troops are in desperate need of equipment. ABC's James Longman is there with the commander of Ukraine's largest tank brigade. Tonight, President Biden hosting German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the White House, thanking him for his support of Ukraine. It comes as Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov in India for a G20 meeting was openly laughed at for making these claims. The war uh, which uh, we are trying to stop and which was launched against us using the Ukraine. <laughs> 
The room filled with international diplomats and dignitaries. But on the battlefield in eastern Ukraine, the situation couldn't be more serious. Hi. We meet the commander of Ukraine's largest tank brigade at his battlefield headquarters. So I'm being shown a live stream of the battle situation right now here on this computer. They've got uh, this map up with uh, battle lines drawn through the east where we are now. Uh, red planes for enemy aircraft, uh, yellow ones for unidentified and green for their own. The commander tells me we hope to have new tanks before Russia moves in because if they start their new offensive, it may be too late. Our thanks to James Longman. March is Women's History Month, and there is a new push in Congress to pass the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, which states that equal rights under the law should not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It first passed Congress in 1972 and has now been ratified by the required 38 states, but not before a required time limit. So ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott sat down with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley to discuss a renewed effort to remove the time restrictions so the ERA can pass. 2023 marks 100 years since the Equal Rights Amendment was first proposed in Congress, 51 years since Congress first passed it. Why is it still necessary? Why now? Well, especially now, uh, in the midst of what we see are really unrelenting, uh, coordinated attacks against uh, women. And uh, it's, we continue to experience uh, second-class status, experience discrimination uh, in the workplace when it comes to pay equity. It's, it's time. The states uh, did their job. Women have done their job. And now Congress must do its job. And you can see more of Rachel's interview with Congresswoman Presley Sunday morning on this week. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a controversial bill is now signed into law. The action one state is taking against drag shows. But next, a desperate situation in the California mountains as residents are stranded after weeks of heavy snow. We're going to talk to one mother about what it was like to be totally cut off for days. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We head out west now where Californians continue to deal with that mess and the complications left behind by the snow. And in Lake Arrowhead, families facing treacherous roads line up for food distribution. That community hit with 109 inches of snow in just seven days. That is remarkable. ABC's DeMarco Morgan is in California with the latest for us tonight. That desperate plea written in the snow, help us. 
Tonight, an all-out desperate effort to free families, some trapped for more than a week in San Bernardino County. The roads are being cleared, there are snow plows everywhere, and you are going to see direct relief coming to your doorsteps shortly. We saw that firsthand in Crestline. These first responders with CAL FIRE have been working overnight to try and make roads like this one accessible. In this case, they're trying to help the gentleman who lives in this house get his car out so he can go see his mother in the hospital. Cassidy and Casey Ringhover have been trying to dig out of their home in Crestline for more than a week. You can see Casey's baby on her back as she shovels. A few days ago, we were standing on top of our cars shoveling them out, but our road is just too packed in to even leave past this point. They are helping families nearby who have rented Airbnbs and are running out of food. Overnight, firefighters struggling in the snowy conditions, dragging hoses over massive snowbanks, fighting multiple house fires caused by leaking gas lines. Officials responding to 1,200 calls for help, removing enough snow to fill the Empire State Building twice. And DeMarco Morgan joins me now. DeMarco, how long do officials think it's going to take to get back to normal there? Well, Phil, officials say it could take a week, if not more, to get to all of the areas that have been impacted by the snow. But a residents that we have been speaking with say they are desperate. They are desperate for help, and they need it right now. A little earlier, volunteers were out here handing out food and much-needed supplies. The line was actually wrapped around the parking lot here, and they are, again, just saying, we need help now. Now, help has started to trickle in. A lot of people have been volunteering and coming again with, you know, food and supplies, even, you know, snow plows trying to help out the community. But again, the ask is help, help us now. All right, DeMarco Morgan, thank you. The hardest hit areas of the Southern California mountains have been so cut off, we're really just now beginning to get a look at what folks there have been facing. As TV crews were able to fly over the area today, they captured this image from Crestline, a help us message written in the snow, desperate plea from residents and visitors stranded a week after that storm hit. Gabby Zamora was one of those folks stranded in the storm with her six-year-old daughter who has Down syndrome. Gabby joins me now. Gabby, thanks for talking to us and taking the time. We appreciate it. Uh, you're down off the mountain now, right? How did you get out? I So um, on day three of being stuck, I was able to like dig into my car and get access to my Wi-Fi. Um, and through there, I was able to call a... Um, I was able to post a Facebook post because when I reached out to the fire department about needing gas for my car so I could stay connected to Wi-Fi and then possibly get down whenever I do uh, get chains and the roads clear up a little bit. So I started making posts and finally a guy and his nephew, um, they were able to come get me in their four by four. And from there, um, um, we, he drove me, it took maybe 30 minutes to get to a shell, which usually would only take maybe 10 minutes to get there. Um, and it was, the, the roads were completely covered. I was able to hire four men who had a mini plow and they were able to unbury my car. It took about four days and four different times for them to come unbury it. Yeah, a harrowing mission and thank heaven for that man and his nephew as well. So you're stranded without electricity or a way to really contact help. You're with your, your, your daughter. This must have been at scary at times, really stressful. How were you feeling during this period where you weren't able to get out? So it was it was a, a wave of emotions. Um, the first night it snowed, we were kind of just like, okay, in the morning we're gonna dig our cars out, and you know, we didn't understand like the severity of it. Um, so uh, that same night, I emailed all my professors because I go to school. And as, as soon as I was able to get emails out, all the electricity shut down, all the Wi-Fi shut down. And even when the electricity did come on for a little bit, um, the Wi-Fi was completely out. It was out the entire time. It's still out out there. Um, and so the next morning after I woke up and saw all the snow on my balcony and covering my porch and, and not being able to really get out of my door, it was... I, I think I cried every morning and all day for like three days. And then finally, the emotions sunk in to kind of just enjoy it with the neighbors, make friends with the community, try to build a snowman if I could, which <laughs> it didn't happen. Because the, the snow was just too high. We were just like sinking into it. Um, but yeah, uh, finally, day three or four, I started getting the motivation to get some help. And then it, it kind of sunk in that we needed to get out. Um, so my daughter has a G-tube. So if that would have it busted or came out, I wouldn't have had an extra one. And then the hole connected to her abdomen would have closed and I wouldn't have been able to get any type of food to her. So 
at some point it went from being sad to being like, okay, I got to get down. Yeah. There's no room to be sad anymore, you know? Yeah, at some point it was survival. How, how are you and your daughter doing now? Um, we're doing good. So we were able to get a motel at the bottom of the mountain. Um, I'm actually in Riverside because I go to school right here. Um, I have my two little dogs with me. Um, it's nice and sunny down here. It's crazy <laughs> that well, it's nice and sunny and people are like, it's snowing in the mountain. And we're like... <laughs> We're all stranded up there, you know? Right. What a difference a day makes for you and your daughter. You shared with us some pictures that you took as the storm was progressing and all of that snow was piling up. Did you ever imagine that you could get this much snow there? Um, I actually just moved out there last March. So it's going on about, it's actually a year to the day. Um, and they told us it snowed maybe a couple feet a year. So, you know, we had a generator, I had uh, snow shovels, you know, brakes, stuff like that, or pickaxes, I'm sorry. Um, and, it, you know, like it, as the severity of hit in the next day when all the snow started hitting and the snow piles weren't coming, it was like, wow. Well, we're so <laughs> glad you and your daughter are okay. We're happy you're off the mountain and we're thinking about everybody else who needs to be. Um, thanks so much, Gabby Zamora, we appreciate it. Thanks. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a popular virtual counseling service settles a case for millions of dollars. The data it's accused of sharing. Plus, Oscar-nominated The Fablemans is based on the life of its director, Steven Spielberg. Celebrated screenwriter Tony Kushner talks about the pressure of turning the famed filmmaker's life into a movie in our road to the Oscars. But first... One of the most watched races in the world kicks off this weekend. We take a look at the Iditarod dog sled race by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charged in a sweeping 56-count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip-hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip-hop on trial. Only on so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
America's Next Top Model, a global phenomenon. Ciao. I could not believe the things that came out of those people's mouths. Watching back this show, it didn't age well. No. What in the cultural appropriation? I didn't think so much in it. I didn't think right. anything about it either. Now I'm like, hello. It's a reality show. America's Next Top Model, 20 years later. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. This weekend, the starting guns will sound for the Iditarod dog sled race. But the world famous trek through the Alaskan wilderness is facing challenges from all sides. So here's a look by the numbers. Just 33 mushers will be on the starting line this weekend. Uh, that's the smallest field, by the way, in the race's 51 year history. Racers topped out at 96 in 2008, but have been declining in recent years. Why? One reason is economic. Last year's winner earned $51,789. That's a small increase from the $50,000 first prize mark back in 1985. Meantime, rising costs are hitting every aspect of the race. For the mushers, the price of dog food rose nearly 16% last year. Race organizers say their supply costs are up about 30%, and rising fuel prices means fewer spectators along the course. Then there's the warmer climate. In 2008, organizers permanently moved the start location 30 miles north, seeking more stable conditions. They've actually had to move further north two times since then. Most recently in 2017, 287 miles north to Fairbanks. And in 2020, three racers and their dogs had to be rescued just 25 miles from the finish line when flooding swamped the ultra-thin sea ice. The teams actually have to skirt around in the final stretch. It's a rough start for the iconic race's second half century. Still, we wish best of luck to all the mushers and their dog teams as they get underway this weekend. And there is much more here on Prime tonight. Rising wait times for travelers. Why it's now taking up to 11 weeks for some to get a new passport. A hero veteran finally getting the Medal of Honor. Why he was never able to receive the award before, despite being nominated twice. And birds falling from the polluted skies of a major city. How an Oscar-nominated documentary is shining a light on just how fragile an ecosystem can be. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting to be asked to host the Oscars again, but... Well, let me be perfectly clear. You were not my first choice. In fact, we asked 
a lot of people before you. Well, I'd rather not know who they were. Let me tell you. Steve Martin, Steve Carell, Steve Buscemi, Steve Austin, Steve Seagal, Steve Urkel. Steve from Blue's Clues. That's just the Steves. Did you ask Steve Harvey? Begged Steve Harvey. He would have been good. Steve Harvey would have been incredible. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Filmmaking can be a personal process, and that is reflected in Best Picture nominee The Fablements, a movie based on the life of one of our generation's most celebrated directors, Steven Spielberg. But Spielberg didn't take on this task alone. By his side, author and screenwriter Tony Kushner, who helped to bring the experiences that made Spielberg who he is to the screen. But for Kushner, it wasn't the pressure of telling Spielberg's story so much as it was the, the self-imposed responsibility of writing a film that families can relate to. Our Lindsay Davis had the chance to sit down with Kushner. Here's their conversation. One more thing, Dolly. Let's not tell your father. It'll be our secret movie, just yours and mine. How much of this story is really Steven Spielberg's life story? Um, all of it, except not necessarily in the order that it happens, and there are little details that are changed. Like, he had one bully, not two. I grew up in Louisiana, and I had two bullies. Go on and say sorry. You're getting me in trouble with my girl. The meeting with John Ford at the end of the movie happened verbatim, but it happened about a year and a half earlier in Steven's life. But that happened when he's like, now get the F out of my office. Uh, <laughs> word for word, the first time Steven told me the story, almost 19 years ago, I wrote it down because I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. They tell me you want to be a picture maker. Um, yes, sir, I do. Why? This business... It'll rip you apart. David Lynch brought his own special, uh, amazing qualities to it. And it's such a great moment in the history of film that Steven Spielberg, when he was young, met John Ford. Now remember this. When the horizon's at the bottom, it's interesting. When the horizon's at the top, it's interesting. When the horizon's in the middle, it's boring as now, good luck to you, and get the out of my office. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. But it actually, I think, is the perfect ending, because what he's really saying is you can't control the forces that you set loose when you make art. Uh, you have to be humble in the face of the stuff that you're playing with because it's powerful. It's about the work. It is, really. This was a difficult film for Steven to do. It's unlike anything he's ever done. You know, it seems silly to say I'm proud of Steven Spielberg, but I really am proud of him. He put himself on the line in so many ways and took such uh, personal risks. I'm really so honored to be a part of it. Did you see it early on as more than even a challenge, but some pressure in telling Steven Spielberg's life story? The pressure in a funny way wasn't so much telling his life story as making sure that we were making a movie that people who don't really care about him or his movies or movies in general could still see this and enjoy it the way that you would enjoy any movie about a family um, and about a young kid discovering a talent and, and a vocation. <gasps> oh. It's so beautiful what you made, Dolly. 
You know, one word that comes to mind is empathy. We feel as the viewer so much for both of his parents. Even his mom, you know, who's having this affair. But yet, I think we're kind of sympathetic to her. How do you write that? One thing that you do is you get Michelle Williams to play her because she's such a rich, extraordinary, complicated actress. I had to crash her a whole lot of times, oh. but the train never got hurt. Really? <laughs> I thought that was the greatest show on earth. <laughs> more, 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 more. I was really moved when I first started hearing Stephen's stories about his mother. Aaliyah was a woman of a generation. It's right before the feminist movement really coheres as this kind of force in society. And these were women who were being told that a career was a possibility for women, but they weren't really uh, exactly encouraged to pursue it. Sammy, Sammy, oh my God, damn it, for weeks now there's been nothing but disrespect from you. Disrespect? Damn it to hell, I'm your mother! I wish you weren't! If you had kids, if you had a family, which is what you were supposed to do, it was all about them and you were supposed to put yourself on the shelf. And there was this kind of mixed message going out to women, I think, of that generation. Part of what makes her deserving of empathy and that makes her a moving character is that she's somebody who has sacrificed a lot. She was a great mother and she tries to make her marriage work, but she falls in love with another man and tragically doesn't fall out of love with her husband. She still clearly loves him, but she's not in love with him. And she tries to make it work. And when it gets to the point where she can't sustain that, where the contradiction is too much, she makes a decision to do what she feels she needs. And the idea that her happiness wasn't completely about us is kind of terrifying, but mothers are people too. Your favorite movie or first movie that you remember seeing really having an impact on you? Oh my gosh. I saw a Joseph Mankiewicz film when I was about nine years old called The Honey Pot. And it's a very complicated plot. And my father and I went to see it. My father was a very smart man, but he couldn't follow the plot. And in the car trip home, he said, I didn't understand what was going on. And I explained the plot to him. And he was not easily impressed. And he was impressed by that. And I really feel like that's the moment when I first thought, maybe this is something I know how to do. First thing you did after you found out you were nominated. I was walking my dog in Central Park, and my husband called me on the phone and said, so congratulations. And then I sat down with my other dog walking friends, and we had uh, coffee in Central Park. And, uh, and I said, I, you know, how nice, how great. <laughs> and your favorite snack to eat when you're watching movies? My favorite snack at all times is chocolate chip cookies. But I want to lose weight before the uh, ceremony because I want to fit comfortably in my tuxedo. But I think sometimes it's just microwave popcorn. Always does the trick. Yeah, I like the popcorn with the goobers in it. That's a good mix. Lindsay, thank you for that. Next, a Medal of Honor ceremony, decades in the making. The state now banning gender-affirming care and drag shows in public spaces. And the multi-million dollar settlement to popular online counseling service just finalized over compromised data. That and more in tonight's rundown. At the White House, President Biden awarded the Medal of Honor to Colonel Paris Davis. Davis was one of the first black officers in the Special Forces. He was 26 and a captain when he and his team were outnumbered by hundreds of North Vietnamese forces in June 1965. Despite being wounded himself, Captain Davis would pull three of his badly injured men to safety. He was nominated by his superiors for the Medal of Honor, but was told the U.S. Army lost his paperwork twice. But you know what Captain Davis said after learning he would finally receive the Medal of Honor? Quote, America was behind me. Tennessee has become the first state to restrict public drag performances. The legislation signed by Governor Bill Lee makes it a criminal offense for someone to engage in adult cabaret performances on public property or where it can be seen by minors. First-time offenders will be charged with a misdemeanor with additional violations constituting a Class E felony. Lee also signed a bill banning transgender health care for people under 18 years old. An 18-year-old man charged with murdering a Chicago police officer was denied bond in court. Stephen Montano has been charged with first-degree murder for allegedly shooting and killing Officer Andres Vasquez Lasso on Wednesday. Police said Montano was chasing a woman with a gun and turned to shoot Vasquez Lasso at close range when the officer was trying to stop him. 
Montana was also shot in an exchange of gunfire with Vasquez Lasso and remains hospitalized in critical condition. As spring break and summer travel approaches, a warning for travelers going overseas. With international travel ramping up, the State Department says it's seeing unprecedented demand for passports, and it's causing some massive delays. It usually takes 8 to 11 weeks to get a new passport. But if you pay 60 bucks, you can expedite yours. If you have urgent travel that's within 14 days, you can make an appointment at a State Department passport office and get your document processed. The online counseling service BetterHelp has agreed to return $7.8 million to customers in a settlement over sharing private data. The company allegedly shared health data it promised to keep private with companies including Facebook and Snapchat. The agreement comes as part of a settlement with the Federal Trade Commission. A proposed order announced by the FTC Thursday would also limit how BetterHelp would be able to share customer data in the future. As the UK is preparing for King Charles's coronation, the palace is keeping tight-lipped on plans for the big day. But with no big names yet announced for the concert in Windsor Castle, reports making headlines saying many top British performers won't be singing for the king. According to Rolling Stone, stars like Adele and the Spice Girls all reportedly turning the opportunity down. Elton John, who regularly performed at concerts for the Queen and sang at Diana's funeral, telling Rolling Stone he has scheduling issues. And the other big question, will Harry and Meghan attend the event? Particularly given the recent news that King Charles has asked them to move out of their UK home to make room for the disgraced Prince Andrew. And finally tonight, meet the director of the Oscar-nominated documentary, All That Breathes. The movie follows two brothers who run a bird hospital in one of the world's most populated and polluted cities, New Delhi. Diane Macedo had the chance to speak with director Shanuk Sen. When we came to the first time, I was going to go to the house for a long time. It was a reptile. First of all, I'd want to say congratulations. How does it feel to be nominated for an Oscar? I think it's a mixture of feeling utterly discombobulated and a kind of monumental relief. And, uh, you know, still struggling to wrap my head around the scale of what has happened. This will take a while to process. What was your reaction when you heard your name called? Extreme relief, disorientation, <laughs> and a weird kind of uh, lack of headiness. Really? Yeah. Why is that? But I think you feel more uh, benumbed. Like you feel a kind of numbness at first. Just like a, just a cold wash of relief at first. And you know, it comes out at five in the morning. You haven't obviously slept all night. And when it comes, you just feel your chest finally decompressing. Hey. All That Breathes focuses on the story of two brothers who are dedicated to saving birds from the pollution in New Delhi. How did you find this story? The thing is, when you live in Delhi, you're always sort of obsessed with the air, especially in the winters, because it feels like your life is laminated by this grey, opaque, visceral expanse. It's this one day when I was sitting in my car, and every time you look up, you have the grey sky and these black dots, the birds, gliding lazily through the sky. I had the distinct sensation of seeing one of these birds sort of plummeting. And I was gripped by this figure of a bird that falls off a polluted sky. It became a deeper film about human non-human entanglement, uh, neighborliness between human non-humans, and a kind of political and emotional account of the city of Delhi through the relationship of the brothers and the black kites. Pollution obviously plays a central role in this film, but you said that you didn't want to make an environmental film or a political film. Why not? We had sort of anti-goalpost set about what we did not want to make. Interesting. We did not want to make a regular conventional nature doc or a wildlife doc. We did not want to make a conventionally front and center kind of a socio-political documentary. Because the idea was to try and do something that is a meld between the ecological, the philosophical, the political, and the emotional inner lives of the brothers. Our foreign funding application rejected. Foreign funding application? FCRA, reject. Why did they reject? I don't know why they didn't give any reason. 
Now, one of the big challenges in the film is the rejection of this foreign application for foreign funding. What did you make of how the brothers handled that? The thing that attracted me to them is that they never, you know, they're never announcing a kind of gloom and doom despair. Instead, they have a kind of wry unsentimental resilience. And similarly with the financial uh, troubles and all kinds of resource-related troubles, they've sort of soldiered on despite all odds. They handled it with a kind of stoic, quiet heroism that is only characteristic to them. And I know you had some setbacks of your own. I read that eight months into the film, you decided to scrap everything that you had shot at that point and start over. Why did you do that and how hard was that? Monumentally hard, of course, I mean, but that's part of the job. The thing is that when we began, I was shooting it like a regular observational verite doc. After about six months of shooting, I realized that shooting handheld, <clears throat> in contrast to the cameras that are shooting us right now, uh, it feels a bit anxious and restless and a bit edgy, whereas the material, I, the world I was shooting and the characters I was shooting are heavily contemplative and, you know, meditative. And the material needed, therefore, to be beautiful. Therefore, we moved towards almost a kind of fiction style where we're using tracks and cranes and dollies, etc., which is usually not used in creative nonfiction. It had to make you think and it had to be contemplative. It also achieves this balance. When you think of New Delhi, you think of this bustling metropolis. And the film shows that, but it also has this element of peace, these quiet moments, a lot uh, exploited in the nature of it. How did you achieve that? Well, Delhi is huge, and like every city in the world, it has all kinds of things, right? It has chaos, it has absolute frenzied madness, while it also has beauty and peace and tranquility and serenity. I've grown up in Delhi, and I, me and the whole directorial team feels very embedded in the vernacular and colloquial cultures of the city. The joy is really in finding you know, the vicissitudes and the flow of it. And any dense work of art has to be able to compress a variety of experiences of life. You've called nonfiction filmmaking seductive. What is it about telling people's true stories that's so special to you? You know, when you embrace the radical unscriptedness of life, without any crutches. It feels like shooting a doc is often like a fever dream. I was in free fall for three years and it's like a delirium. Your life gets illuminated by the film and the film gets illuminated by the world uh, of your life. It's absolutely seductive and addictive because you're basically being rewarded by accidents by the world itself. We are wishing you good luck at the Oscars and thank you so much for being on thank with you. us today. Thank Congratulations. You. Thanks so much. Fascinating conversation, Diane. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and of course, at abcnews.com. Have a great night. at stake in our world right now.